so. There's the all lady. Right. She's ready to roll. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So we are going over our winter 2024 Snowy Plover Guardian program. All of the little, I don't know if I want to say nitty gritty, but all of the basic volunteer stuff that you guys need to know for the winter side of things. Um, and if you've been here before, you've seen a lot of these same slides, but we want to just give a refresher because it's a slightly different mindset than it is during summer. And so this is our agenda for today. We're going to briefly talk about the snowy plover overwintering natural history. Um, Clovers versus sanderlings and how to tell the two apart, some Monterey specific overwintering info, some site specific logistics, uh, dog regulations at the beaches where we are of particular interest for winter, um, and our updated messaging for winter, responses to a lot of the common comments that we'll get from people that we encounter out there, um, some reminders, really important reminders, as well as um, requesting suggestions. So getting started with our snowy plover overwintering natural history. Um, plovers winter from all the way from Oregon way up here down to Baja, California. Um, this is pretty similar to their breeding range, um, though that goes into Washington and doesn't tend to include terribly much of Baja, California. Um, researchers, researchers have found that between 25 to 40 percent of plovers will remain year-round, um, and this number usually averages to being around 30 percent at most sites. We do know that males have a higher overwintering presence than females in their breeding sites as well. And in Monterey, we have about 41% um, of males who stay and 25% of females who will stay. Um, plovers will migrate both north and south of their breeding sites to arrive at their wintering habitats. And um, plovers generally are seen flocking in the winter, so kind of buddy-buddy and hanging out together, unless they are out feeding on invertebrates and kelp flies. They really like to hang out in small depressions in sand. Um, we often see them hanging out in uh, sitting in footprints, and flocks can be quite large. We have um, we have documented flocks as large as 150, but the average flock sizes tend to be anywhere between 15 and 60 birds. I think the largest I've personally seen this year has been like 65 to 70 so far. Um, and they will also flock with other birds, not just with other snowy plovers. We've seen them mingling with sanderlings and other species of plovers and sometimes just completely other bird species as well. During the earlier part of the winter season, plovers are a bit flighty, um, ready to migrate, and they'll leave easily when disturbed, but once the winter season really gets started, um, they kind of tolerate people walking up closer to them than they do during the breeding season. Most of our breeding, breeding birds um, that do migrate for the winter will remain in California, but they, they tend to go south. Um, we do have a few that'll go up to San Francisco, though. The farthest south that I've um, been able to look up our birds going is San Diego, but I only looked for the last couple of years. Um, so there's a possibility that we had one historic bird that really liked to travel, but um, I didn't find him. We also rely on um, other plover monitors and bird watchers to report our birds to us, so we don't always know where every single one of our bird over birds overwinter, and there may be um, some that overwinter further south or further north than what I've actually got listed up here. And we do actually get a fair number of birds that stop over and overwinter here. Um, and a lot of our vacationing birds arrive from Oregon and um, other Northern California sites. We do also get a few that come up from the South, which is interesting that they'll go in the opposite direction of what we usually see. Um, so we have a couple that come from San Diego and Santa Barbara for the winter. 
Um, and then we are going to go into the differences between plovers and sanderlings. So this is pretty important for when we're out there talking to people. Um, and so we want to be able to describe what our plovers look like in winter. And so our plovers have this winter plumage where they have um, pale gray, brown, or tannish feathers on their back side and on their head. They have a small really itty bitty small dark beak and some gray legs. Um, so males lose all of their breeding plumage and they'll look pretty similar if not exact to females to the point where you can't in at all tell them apart. They all weigh roughly 40 grams um, and I usually describe them as self-running tennis balls, which is really helpful when you're talking to dog owners as to why they need to keep their dogs on a leash, because these are self-running. They're great for chasing. We don't want that. <laughs> and they tend to forage either um, alone or loosely in groups with others. They eat kelp flies and other invertebrates. Um, plovers are often flocking together at the base of the dunes and sometimes like I said, they'll flock with other bird species. Um, they winter from mid-August to early March when their breeding season begins again. Um, plovers will start migrating if um, they are not year-round residents. They'll start migrating to their breeding grounds around February and March with the breeding season beginning in earnest in late March and early April. Sanderlings, though, um, in the winter, they have their, their really long beak and their black legs, but they're also more of a pale gray color with darker gray at the shoulders. Um, they weigh around 60 grams, so they're a bit bigger. They're like a, a softball compared to a plover's baseball, kind of that sort of size difference. Um and they tend to forage in large groups um, with their beaks going in and out of the sand and they tend to eat aquatic invertebrates that have just been deposited by the tides or they probe along the sand the wet sand to look for hidden amphipods and crustaceans so because of this they're often seen at the tide lines and they're going in and out with the waves um Sanderlings, luckily, sanderlings aren't present all that much during the breeding season, the plover breeding season. So the confusion between these two species um, doesn't last long and is um, prevalent mostly during our winter season, which is why we're talking about it right now. Um, they are here in Monterey between mid-August and they leave um, in early May to go to their own breeding sites, which are up to the north. Um, and so here's a side-by-side -side comparison of sanderlings and plovers. You can really see the difference in their beak size um, and the colors. Of course, there's color variations just between individuals, but this is pretty standard colors um, of what they look like when they're next to each other. And so there are some other birds that can be confused with overwintering plovers, including the semi-palmated plover, black-bellied plover, particularly in their um, over in their wintering plumage, and killdeer. Um, both the black-bellied plovers and the killdeers are much, much bigger than snowy plovers, as well as having this longer beak. Semi-palmateds um, are much closer in shape and color as snowies with a very similar beak. Um, however, they have a much more darker tan brown uh, colored feathers, as well as having this really light tannish legs compared to the plover's gray. Um, and this is our same plover from earlier, so you can see the gray versus the tan color. Um, they also have this continuous collar that goes all the way around the neck, which is a major um, feature of the semi-palmated plover. And while they're um, not rare, they're not super common in Monterey, we usually have a couple hanging around out, um, out there in recent years, and so you might still see them. There we go. 
So going on to our overwintering plovers, specifically in Monterey, um, these are the numbers for our overwintering plovers that we've seen in the past um, 11 years now. We have a large number of plovers that will overwinter here in the Monterey district. Um, we have more in the Monterey district, certainly than we do in the Santa Cruz district of state parks. Um, and we have fairly good numbers that they're increasing throughout the years. Um, though uh, we had our highest numbers in um, 2017-18 winter season. I believe, oh wait, no, 2015-2016 overwintering season. Um, and that was right before we had this huge decline due to ravens and crows. Um, so uh, um, going into the sites where we usually see them, uh, Carmel River State Beach, plovers can be found both um, to the south and the north of the river mouth. Uh, Monterey State Beach, we usually can see a couple um, to the uh, right around West Bay Avenue, which is right here. Um, but we also sometimes have the flock hang out over here towards the Tides Hotel. Um, and they there is some construction happening here at the... Um, water treatment plant, but I believe that parking here is still completely open and easily accessible. Um, when you're visiting Moss Landing, for anyone who's really interested, um, those first two sites are our main focus beaches, but for anybody who's interested in going to any other beaches, we do also have um, people, uh, plovers that hang out at Moss Landing State Beach, and so we've got them usually up here towards the north of this northern access, though so sometimes we also get some that hang out down here between the other access points. So that's a fun spot that um, you can go out and see if there's any plovers or anybody to talk to right there as well. Um, at Madowski State Beach, um, plovers tend to flock right along the Pajaro River mouth, um, and it kind of depends on the day which side of the river mouth they'll be at. We tend to have a closed river, so this picture doesn't do it justice. Usually the river is fully um, breached and going into the ocean, but um, we'll have some on the northern side near the, the um Pajaro Dunes Colony, or we'll have some at the south side. Um, and if you do happen to read color bands and you want to report them, you are more than welcome to email me. I absolutely love getting sightings in. Or if you see an injured plover, please, please, please email me or actually call me since you guys have my phone number. Um, but um, the way that you read a plover's bands is it's um, the left leg, right? It's the left leg and then the right leg. And so you'll go upper left band, lower left band, upper right band, lower <laughs> right band. So for this guy, he's white, blue, green, blue. For this, I'm going to call it a lady, even though we're pretending it's winter um yellow red orange blue so that's how you read it um these are uh i believe two birds that we banded here in monterey other um so we have our usual primary colors but we also have colors like aqua um violet lime pink that show up black and gray and um if you're not sure the you can just tell me, uh, write out the color band on how you see it. Or if you take a picture, that would also be fantastic if you have that ability. Um, so going into some site-specific logistics, uh, we do not have any lifeguards or um, uh, our plover beach fencing is being taken down and removed. Most of it has been removed. We still have a little bit more to do, but... Um, probably by the time you guys get going out there in earnest, we will have all of our fencing, our plover fencing removed. Um, so this means that state parks no longer has as much of a visual pe presence on the beach, um, which may encourage more people to bring their dogs out onto the beach or to enter um, permanently closed areas. Um, 
and even though we've removed our beach fencing, our plovers are still there. <laughs> um, just because we no longer have a fenced off area specific to plovers doesn't mean that they've left. Um, and Monterey State Beach in particular does have a permanent fence that's out there for dune restoration. Um, it does get moved back um, during the winter season um, and then moved back out for the plover breeding season. So the combination of lifeguards and beach fencing means plovers and park rules are not likely to be at the forefront of beachgoers' minds. Um, did I, yeah, okay. Uh, so most important thing is uh, to be at the top of your mind, though, is safety. You should always be sure that someone knows where you are and to check in with that person at the end of your shift. It can be me. It can be your best friend. It can be your roommate. Um, just as long as somebody knows where you are in case an emergency happens. Um, it's helpful to look at tide charts before you leave. Um now that we're heading into winter when we have beach erosion as well as a lot of higher tides and more storms it's possible that beaches are not um, as accessible or are only accessible at low tides so it is important to know about this um, it's also important to know just because if water gets on your phone um, i've had that happen to my phone where one single drop of water got in there and i no longer had a phone it was a big bummer so it's important to just be aware for your own electronics and things like that. Um, you can always change your monitoring days if you were really wanting to go out on uh, consistently on like Mondays or something and a tide is just not good. You can just change it. We're totally flexible on that. Um, all that matters is that you stay safe. Um, other basic beach safety includes just not turning your back on the ocean, which is particularly important in winter when we have larger swells and higher tides due to storms. Um, this is also why uh, staying away from river breaches and river mouths is important for safety. Tides can really affect how strong the river current is and the depth can be um, really deceptive. Uh, so be careful and be aware of tides if you do decide to approach a river and remember to drink a lot of water and wear sun protection. Um, also really important is that if you ever feel unsafe approaching a dog owner for whatever reason, um, you don't have to approach him. Do doesn't have, you don't have to worry about the reason. The vibes could just be off and you can decide to not approach them. Um, what you need to do when that happens is just wait until you are in a safe place and then call it into dispatch. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter if it's just like a dog breed makes you uneasy or uncomfortable or the dog owner is just really loud. It could be anything. Um, and you should also feel empowered to just, if you're already talking to a dog owner and it's not going well, you can just end it. Um, before anything, before it gets heated, just go ahead and end it. Just say, yeah, okay, you're right, whatever, and walk away. So, um, with that, Carmel River State Beach is one of our main monitoring beaches for Plover Guardians during winter. Um, and I mentioned that the river mouth can be dangerous and to stay away from the river mouth. Um, if the river mouth is closed, so we've got this nice sand buildup, um, you don't have to worry about that. It's safe to pass through. However, if the river mouth is open um, and you have the river mouth running freely on uh, into the ocean, then it's best to not try to um, ford the river or try to pass through the river to get to the other side. Um, even with that, dog walkers might be on the other side. Um, so what you'd have to do is drive to the other side or find a different way around um, to access that south side. Um, for Carmel River State Beach, that means that you can park and access from uh, Cali La Cruz or Cuesta Way. Um, and you can find those on Google Maps pretty easily. So talking about um, dog regulations at beaches of interest. 
Um, these are two primary areas of interest, Carmel River State Beach and Monterey State Beach, which is the, I can never say this correctly, um, Houghton Roberts Beach and Seaside Beach combined together equals Monterey State Beach. Um, Monterey State Beach in particular has a high level of dog infractions. Um, both of these beaches are where our plover guardians are spending a lot of their time interacting and educating dog owners. Um, I've found that it's really uh, great to inform dog owners um, where the nearest dog-friendly beach is if I've been having a particularly good conversation and a good interaction with those dog owners. Um, I actually had at least one dog owner um, tell me that they really, really actually appreciated hearing an alternative instead of just kicking them off the beach. It lets them know that there are places that they can take your dog to and that you're not just trying to be mean and kick them off the beach you're actually like oh this is where you can go um and it it causes for a bit of a better uh interaction which is very very nice um and so you should also tell them that uh once they read the uh sorry um so at monterey state beach in particular uh let's actually go back to here um, so the seaside north of the Tides Hotel is our no dog zone, but south of the Tides Hotel is actually dog friendly as long as they're on leash, which is really important. Um, and Carmel River State Beach, they do have to stay on leash as well. They can have their dogs there. They just have to stay on leash. And so, um... Be going beyond that, sometimes even if a dog is allowed on leash, you want to tell them where they can have their dog off leash. Um, so for Carmel River State Beach, I think also for Monterey State Beach, Carmel City Beach, so not Carmel River State Beach, it's the Carmel City Beach, which is very confusing. Um, dogs are allowed off at the city beach. Um, and I like to call it dog heaven. It's a really great dog beach. Um, that's where I always try to like tell people that they can take their dog um, and let them go a little bit nuts. Um, for Monterey State Beach, there's really no immediate dog off leash zone, but south of the Tides Hotel, dogs are allowed on leash. Um, north of Tioga, until the south boundary of Fort Ord Dune State Beach is a dog on leash area. Um, and for Fort Ord Dune State Beach, it's really important to try to describe to them that boundary point because it can be very difficult to, for people to know where it's at. Um, so this is just a map of where these areas are. You can see Carmel River State Beach and Carmel City State Beach. They're right next to each other. Really easy to convince somebody to just hop on over. Um, for Seaside and Fort Ord, really easy for somebody to hop on the highway and go down a couple more exits to get to Del Monte Beach or um, Houghton Roberts Beach. The exception to our dog rules, though, are always service animals. And so these are usually dogs that are trained for a specific task that directly related that's directly related to an individual's disability. Um, so this does not include emotional support animals um, because support animals, they're, they're not given the same exceptions as service dogs. Service dogs are um, trained to a specific task. So emotional support animals um, are not trained. They just um, provide emotional support, which is just something that you do when it's something super soft and cuddly. Um, so service animals, you can kind of tell the difference between the two because service animals are usually calm animals that remain really close to their owners. Um, they may or may not be wearing a vest that um, says service dog or service animal on it. Um, this can sometimes make it difficult to know if uh, the animal is actually performing a service until you talk to the person. Um, they also don't have to be leashed. 
um, if that would interfere with their tasks. Um, and so uh, this is really important to know because sometimes somebody will tell you that it's a service dog um, and you have to respect that. Um, especially um, I find it best to just believe when someone tells me that their their dog is a service animal unless it's acting crazy and you can kind of tell um and if you are in doubt legally we can only ask two questions to determine if an animal actually qualifies as a service animal and those include is this animal required because of a disability That's not my favorite question. I kind of feel like it's very rude. <laughs> but um, you can also ask, because usually someone will tell you that this is a service animal if you've set, just come up and uh, told them that dogs aren't allowed on the beach. They'll be like, oh, this is my service dog. So it's much more easy to flow into the, top, the, the question of, oh, well, what work or task has your animal been trained to perform? I think that's a... nicer way of kind of fishing for information but also um it flows in the conversation and doesn't feel like an interrogation um and usually i've found that if you have a friendly attitude and you're genuine with the owner um the the dog owner will be perfectly happy to tell you what their dog has been trained for um and also as a reminder that service dogs are not just your um stereotypical service dog for the blind kind of um, service dog. Uh, so it's not always a Labrador. It's not always a German Shepherd. I've come across um, service dogs that are pugs because they um, are a blood sugar uh, alert dog um, that can tell when your blood sugar is dropping. Uh, I've come across like um, other small dogs that um, are able to detect if you're an if you're having an aneurysm or a stroke so dogs service dogs actually come in all shapes and sizes and um, you can't tell just by looking at a breed is what I'm trying to <laughs> come uh, uh, describe um, and so if you uh, are really uh doubting a person then it's best to ask them the task and most tasks um, there's a lot of tasks that a dog can be trained to perform um, really to determine if an emotional support dog is trying to be passed off as a service dog they'll tell you it's for their emotional support and then you can let them know that they actually do not have the same uh, rights as a service dog and so you got to take them off the beach. So um, I feel like that most of our messaging uh, will be very familiar or it'll come off as common sense but it's always worth getting a refresher. Um, so in winter birds are resting and they're recovering from a really probably hard breeding season just because they push themselves a lot um, and they do this at their wintering sites the ones that we described earlier um, and so wintering sites for people who are unfamiliar with what they are you can describe wintering sites as where birds are found for the entirety of the winter and can be at their breeding sites or a site that they migrate to Birds can also stop and rest for a short period of time before continuing on their migration route um, at stopover sites. And these are temporary winter sites, um, and they're very important for migrating birds as they need to stop and eat while on the move. They migrate to places that have higher food sources so that they can restore their fat reserves, usually in climates that are warmer than their breeding sites in winter. Um, and during winter, plovers are resting and recovering from a very long breeding season and getting ready for the next breeding season. And this is why it's um, detrimental when birds are harassed by dogs or humans while they're resting. This causes a bird to use up their energy reserves, um, at which they need to make that return migration and to be in good health for the next breeding season. 
Um, you know, it's not easy taking care of all those eggs and chicks. <laughs> And so our beaches serve as, uh, they serve a large community of people, some of whom come from quite far away to get here. And one of our services is a calm experience where our guests can escape urbanization, see and hear wildlife, and relax in a calm environment. And unfortunately, dogs can often ruin that experience for other people. A loud dog barking can scare off wildlife or drown out ocean waves and forgotten poop bags and tennis balls can really ruin the look of our beaches and make the experience less enjoyable by just being surrounded by a lot of trash. We also have to remember that some people just have a fear of dogs or they just don't like dogs and they don't want to be approached by a dog or be scared while they're on vacation. And we also want our doggy visitors to have a calm experience, which is why there are dog friendly beaches. And one of the main reasons that dogs are not allowed on the beach um, or are required to remain on a leash is for the safety of the dog and for our wildlife. Many people don't seem to realize that our beaches are still actually wild spaces. And while we manage our beaches, while we manage our beaches and create a great recreational space for our um, beach visitors, we mainly manage our beaches for the benefit of wildlife. This means that animals like skunks, coyotes, and even foxes can use these spaces. And as I've said, these animals are wild. They may be aggressive to dogs. Um, in fact, I've actually watched a pack of coyotes be aggressive to a dog owner and his two Germ German shepherds um, because they were near a whale carcass and they wanted to protect their food source. Luckily, they were just trying to scare them off, and when the dogs did leave the area, it was all good, but it was kind of scary to see, <laughs> uh, let alone probably be in the middle of it. Um, we also want to protect our wildlife from dogs. Um, uh, we've talked about this in past uh trainings and things, but I have actually seen instances of plover chicks being smothered by dogs and nests um, full of eggs being eaten. So we know that dogs can have a detriment to our species. And not only, not only all of that, but not all dogs are friendly with each other and Bad interactions have happened with dogs. Um, not all owners are willing to leash their dogs, even if they're unfriendly, or they know their dogs can be aggressive, but they still refuse to put a leash on them. I've had a, an interaction with a dog owner who purposefully brought a non-neutered, untrained dog to the beach, and he didn't even have a leash with him. <laughs> um he was nice, though, and he actually uh, took his dog immediately off the beach when I told him to. So um, there's, you know, there's that at least. Uh, <laughs> there are also some dogs who um, look friendly until they're approached and um, or who are friendly with people, but they're aggressive to dogs. So at the end of the day, what this means is it's the dog owners who are responsible for injuries or damages that are caused by their dogs. So that's a very important message for people to know <laughs> that things can happen. Uh, one of the other things that we're concerned about is um, uh, what dogs interact with when they're on the beach um, in terms of dead wildlife that wash up on the beaches. Dogs are opportunistic scavengers, um, which means that when they come across a potential food source, a dog's first instinct is to just go ahead and eat, um, which can be an issue um, even at home for some dogs. And this behavior can be trained out, but um, it's still an in instinct that they all have. And why this is a problem is because dead wildlife may contain toxins or parasites that can harm dog. Um, they can um, transfer Ill some kind of illness or uh, 
disease that um, otherwise a dog would not interact with. Um, there's also the chance that dogs playing in the ocean will um, be exposed to bacteria or events like red tides or harmful algal blooms. Some of the toxins released during these blooms are known to damage a dog's organs that can cause um, vomiting, seizures, and respiratory issues. Um, and we're not just concerned about how our beaches are affecting dogs. Um, most of the time, dogs are perfectly safe, but these are just factors to keep in mind. Um, we're also concerned about how dogs affect our beaches. So um, dog feces are just kind of one kind of gross. Um, they also, uh, we don't know what that dog has been exposed to. So we don't know what that dog, um, what the feces from that dog could put into our environment. Um, and while many dog owners are responsible, there are many who are not and they don't pick up after their dogs or um, they'll bag their, their dog's feces and then just leave them on the beach or in the park. Um, and that not only uh, doesn't remove the dog feces, but it puts plastic into the environment um and i have been told that they do that so that they remember to they pick it up on their way out i think that's a lie <laughs> um because there's too many times where i've come week after week and that same dog bag is still there um <laughs> so i think the most important message we can try to get across though is that dogs should at minimum be leashed. If you can't convince a dog owner to leave, we can at least try to convince them to leash their dog. Um, I've unfortunately come across a number of dog owners who didn't even bring a leash when walking their dogs on the beach, um, including beaches where dogs aren't even allowed. So um, this is the main, I think, one of the main educational messages to try to impart onto our dog owners is to always have a leash on them and to leash their dogs at all times. Um, and as always, the most important thing is to remember to stay safe when talking to dog owners with our updated winter messaging. Um, if you see someone doing something unsafe, such as climbing on rocks or trying to cross a fast flowing river, you can remind other beachgoers of the, the basic safety and park rules that we talked about. Um, Many unsafe activities are not actually allowed on, on our beaches, and it's just using common sense. Um, and so uh, these are some responses to some common comments that I've had. You can also feel free to add common comments that you've heard in the chat, and we can discuss how to respond to those comments after I finish um, talking. <laughs> Um, so this is kind of a, a funny one because dogs do harm birds and while they're a member of the family, um, if the dog was alone, they would act like a dog and chase and harass birds for fun. Um, they might not bite or kill a bird, but they can still harm a bird by scaring it and making it use up all of its energy reserves to fly away and escape. Um, and while a bird is not actively chasing, while a bird, yeah, while a dog is not actively chasing birds, their presence has actually been shown to increase the probability of shorebirds being disturbed and leaving an area. So we need to remind our dog owners that dogs are predator shaped and a bird doesn't recognize the difference between a domestic dog and a coyote. Um, and it's always fun <laughs> to have someone tell you that how long they've been ignoring the rules of a park that they visit. Um, I've often had uh, someone tell me that I've been bringing my dog to this beach for 20 odd years um, and no one has ever talked to me before, told me that I can't. <laughs> and I mean, it is actually really easy Um it's both easy and hard to believe. In some areas, um, at certain times of the day, it's really easy for a dog owner to slip in and out of the beach. Um, however, we have numerous signs at our state parks um, and other areas have a higher 
park uh, enforcement presence. So depending on where I am, this comment is more likely to be true than at other places. However, they should still be checking their signs um, and the park, our state parks website has a lot of information on where they can take their dog. Um, a number of people who say this um, comment are um, ones that are coming in to areas where no signs are at the access um, or they'll say that they have no signs at the access um, and if they access to state parks from an actual access and not from a neighboring non-state parks beach or from off trail then uh, we know that there's signs there um, and they just either miss them or were willfully ignorant is usually what I call it um, so they purposely kind of like don't look um, and it this is um you know it's great that people take their dogs out for a walk in nature but the rules of the beach mean that an alternative park would be a much better option for them um there are other beaches where dogs are allowed um not always or not even usually a state parks um and whenever someone tries to use this comment it's a pretty great segue to offering the brochure um, and so this one is actually a really interesting comment because some people have actually trained their dog to be on a uh, voice command or a vocal or electronic leash. Um, and this generally would indicate that their dog is very, very well trained. But um, the fact still remains that a well trained dog can still override that training. Um, however rare, um, and so then they can also still have the potential to harm animals, other dogs, or people. Um, and so when responding to this kind of comment, I think it's best to frame the dog's behavior in a positive way while rem reminding the, the dog owners of state parks rules. Um, so I would say something like, well, it's wonderful that your dog is trained to respond to vocal command or e-leashes. E um, California State Parks does not recognize them as proper leashes. We only recognize a physical leash as, um, as a leash, and they're the only ones that are currently approved. Um, so I actually did have to double check this because um, I, for a long while, I had never heard of e-leashes. It's pretty new, I believe, um, but... Uh, has leash in the name so it, you gotta sometimes double check but we only um and i believe most city and county ordinances say it has to be a physical leash um so that's also important to be aware of and then this is yeah this is one of my favorite comments because it just gives you a chance to discuss birds and how birds can look very similar um and how their actions and habits can tell them can can be how you tell them apart even when you don't have binoculars um and so we talked a little bit about how people will misidentify sanderlings as plovers and the easiest way um to to tell people that they probably saw sanderlings is to talk about um how sanderlings will flock in huge huge numbers um and then we'll often see them running in and out with the tides as they feed and so we can tell them that plovers are also flocking but um and sometimes in large numbers but usually usually pretty small flocks um and they like to stay up close to the dunes and hang out in our footprints um, and so now I have reminders for everyone. We have two trainings that are really important. Um, some people have done these and they don't need um, refreshers, but it's, it would be good for everyone to look at their um, qualifications page in their uh, better impact and to take a look. So we want to look at the bear in mind training. That's our state park sexual harassment training. Very fun. Um, and I think, Amanda, do you remember if this is bi-yearly every two years or every, once a year? Yeah, 
I think it's every two. I think it's every two years. Yeah, yeah. this has to be done every two years. Um, so it's just good to double check that you're up to date and you don't have to worry about it. We do also have to do a COVID-19 training. And as far as I'm aware, you only have to do it once because there's only a thing that says I've completed it. But we do need everybody to complete it. We have been getting <laughs> we have been getting scolded. So everybody needs to complete this. <laughs> um, and uh, if you haven't completed these two trainings or your bear in mind training has lapsed, um, either you have gotten an email or you will be getting an email from one of us um just reminding you to please do it um and so we'll uh we'll send out some reminders if need be but this is just us begging you to please please do the trainings um and uh, another reminder is that we do have um, not only our regular snowy plover um, opportunities of going out and talking to people on the beach um, kind of our roaming activities but we also have tabling opportunities um and so these are tabling opportunities that are at the access points of the beach um and this can um include information more than just plovers such as beach habitat and restoration efforts um and it would also make the dog owner education happen before they even enter the beach. Um, for the tabling events that I've done with Bonnie and Yvonne, it's been really nice to be able to tag team so we can have one person at the table, one person roaming on the beach, um, or have two people at the table, as well as keeping an eye out on the beach. And that way, one person can, um, if we see a dog already on the beach, one person can run down to the beach and take care of that while the other person still mans the table. So it's a really nice um, addition to our regular snowy plover uh, opportunities and activities. And so these opportunities are also really great for events. Um, we did a lot of events, tabling events this year, actually. So we um, participated in the Marina Earth Day event. Um, we tabled at CSUMB a number of times. Um, and we've done the Bird Festival. And um, we're hoping to add even more into the future. So this is just a reminder for... Um, everyone besides Bonnie and Yvonne <laughs> that um, to feel free to do our tabling opportunities and to um, feel like they can come out and do these tabling opportunities or um, request to even man a table um, if they don't know of an, an event or day where it's happening. Um, and then I also wanted to remind everyone, we have a website. Um, so uh, this is a website specifically for our Snowy Plover volunteers, and it has all of our newsletters hosted on there, um, as well as upcoming events and um, just a whole bunch of like any news that I find about plovers um, anywhere in the range and things like that. Um, and if I find any open access research, there will be links to that and things like that on our website. So I just wanted to remind everybody that that exists because I'm never sure how many people are looking at it. Um, during the breeding season, I also update our numbers of nests and chicks and things like that. So there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, and so we're getting towards the end. Um, oh, one last thing to mention that I forgot to put a slide for. We have updated our dog brochure maps. Um, and so Amanda will be getting some new prints out at our marina office. And um, we'll probably send some over to the Monterey office as well. You're still good to use your regular dog brochure maps um, so don't worry about that. Just know that when you grab a new set of, of drug brochures that it'll be slightly updated. Um, and so now this is the section where I ask you guys to give me all of your suggestions for what you want to see. Um, in the future, I really want to hear from you guys. We're still, like I say this every time, but I still consider the, us in the early years of the program. And so we can kind of develop it a little bit more to match your guys' interest. And so I want to know um, opinions about um, 
what you think about uh, social media use or if anybody is interested in being, you know, volunteering as a social media manager or if you think that someone would ever want to do that in the future or is that asking too much. Um, I'm kind of curious what you guys would think about seeing a Plover Guardians being on Facebook or Instagram. Um, we also... Uh, I would like to know opinions on beach cleanups that are hosted by us um, featuring Plover Guardians. So this would be a strictly winter season activity, um, but I like the idea of getting the beach ready for plovers for the breeding season. Um, of course, you're always welcome to pick up beach, uh, beach, yeah, pick up trash when you're out on the beach um, and you're talking to dog owners anyway. Um, but this would be a nice, uh, actually, focused beach cleanup and um i always try to push for for bark rangers or pets for plovers um program but um we don't allow a lot of dogs on our beaches so it never takes off but this would be more of like a joint venture with um our neighboring beaches and maybe exploring further inland as well so i'd love to have your guys's opinion on things like that um but yeah any suggestions or ideas you guys come up with i would absolutely love to hear them and then we also have our um, after season survey. So this is pretty similar to the one that we did last year. Um, this is just a QR code to make it super easy to go um, and do the survey. Um, and that's it. That's our training. Hey, right on time. <laughs> um, and so if anybody has any comments or questions, I would love to hear them. Yeah, and feel free to either unmute or you could you do the raise hand function, which is at the bottom, or you yes. can put something in the chat, anything you'd like. And um, uh, yeah, thanks so much, Esther. I, I feel like I always learn something new every time we do one of these trainings. Yeah, um, we always update. Um, we always try to update the 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 trainings, even if they don't change by much, because we always learn something new um, every single time. <laughs> Um, yeah, so discussing the, the fun animation, uh, is it Piper or Pipper on, uh, Piper, that, uh, I think, yeah, I think it's Piper. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a fun one too. I know when it first came out, I talked to Chris, our snowy plover, um, monitoring boss. Um, she was just like, ah, oh, but it's like a conglomeration of all the shorebirds that nest on the beach and I was like oh but it's still so cute oh, pretty cute um oh. Lorna had a had a question here in the chat yes. um tell us more about the bark ranger idea please wants to yes. hear more about that so I know it is a thing that um some national uh not national forests but um, some national parks have done um, where it's essentially like a, it's more for the dog owner than the dog, of course. But essentially it's um, if you go through this really short training and you can take a pledge where it's like, I will, I will always bag my, my dog's poop. I will always do this. I will always keep to the trails. Sometimes there's fun acronyms. Um, as well and it's just like making this promise that you're going to be taking your dog where it should be you're going to be a good dog owner and clean up after your dog and um be aware of the environment and the animals around you and the harm that your dog could do or um things like that and then you can usually get like a little um this little badge or if there is a pets for plovers thing that's on the east coast for the piping plover um or you can get bandanas and things and so it kind of just proves that you're you're taking your dogs um under well you're taking your own awareness of what your dog does in shared space and on the beach to the next level um and it's also just kind of like a physical representation of the that you've gone through a bit of a learning um, process um, and you're respecting the beach and the organisms there. 
Um, and I think it's really cute. I think it might get some buy-in from some people. Um, and also would mean that you get more of a scolding, I think, if you do break the rules. <laughs> um, I was gonna, I was gonna say, I feel like there's also an element of um, places where dogs are legally allowed on the beach. Like if a dog owner approached another dog owner and yeah. talked to them, there's like, oh, you're part of my community versus when we show up right and we've got our yeah uniforms and and we look it's all like bird watchers, yeah they're like, oh, and it's you bird watchers who are just it's dog a way haters. of yeah it's So definitely the a way messenger of interacting is different. yeah it's definitely a way of interacting with dog owners where it's positive um versus like Mm. oh you did this it's more of a like congrats your dog is now a dog ranger you know your dog gets a certificate that we printed on slightly better card stock than just printer paper but it's you know it's fun for people i think it would be something that would be interesting to try to um see happen at like um either spca trainings where where people take their puppies Good idea. or like at pet smart or something but um it's Something where we would definitely need to know that our volunteers are on board and willing to do it before we try to implement it because we don't have the time to do it. Um, Yeah, it, it is kind so of a big project, but it's Bonnie, a big ask, but I do want Bonnie to, yeah. likes the plover beach cleanup idea, and Yvonne gave it a heart. And then Yay. Marsha had a good idea of wanting to see more, Yeah. um, you know, hard copies of the dog map brochures at kiosks, Yeah. um, uh, at different And when beaches I, like at Seaside and Moss Landing. Yeah. And um, I mean, maybe even at, you know, like Rip Van Winkle open space where people take their dogs. And it's kind of like a dog board there. That's a really good idea. If you think Yeah, of um, I do any other wonder place, that would be good for those brochures. I yeah, I, I and, do and when I yeah, when go I'm ahead. saying hard copy, sorry, I mean like the poster that you had for your tabling event. Like You know, a, a large big laminated one. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. a large, nice. I have wondered about this is like a not getting permission and asking forgiveness later. type of thing but um <laughs> printing the qr code with like a little little label that just says want to know where to take your dog and then just slapping it everywhere <laughs> um, so that is i do like the idea of at least having a sign somewhere that says um that like has a qr to the map especially since the map stays updated um on online the online map And so if that's something that we can get approved and it's something really simple, like we can print out a sticker and just slap it onto an existing kiosk without much work, um, I think we should try to, we'll try to get that done. We just need to get, um, to do it officially, we need to get some approval, but I do think it is um, a fantastic idea. And we could probably do that at every kiosk as well. Yvonne Yeah. had a good idea of, um, she likes the bandana idea for our regular dog visitors at the beaches where being there is allowed, Yeah. but they're like model citizens, a model dog. Yeah, I do wonder if we could do like a dog event, which would be interesting, where maybe we give a little spiel and then um, do a dog walk on the recreation trail um, away from the beach or something. <laughs> um, we could also go, um, yeah, maybe I'll talk to Monterey Regional Parks and maybe we can do like some kind of co-event between the two of us um state parks and and them that's a good idea they're also they're trying to put in a pretty expansive off-leash dog like fenced in off-leash dog park area um you know east of the discovery center at paulo corona regional park so someday there's gonna be some big unveiling some big party that'd there be fun we could be there <laughs> yeah yeah and i know they want to do um some beach cleanups as well i think this winter um so we might see about um coordinating with them for some beach cleanups as well so um stay tuned on the beach cleanups i think we we definitely have some interest from state parks but i think if we can um advertise it and host through the 
the um, Plover program, I think will be very successful. Um, we might request some help on deciding on the beaches from you guys and things like that, as well as just making sure your presence is there. Um, yeah, go ahead, Marsha. Sorry, I think the main time to do the beach cleanups is after holidays, because I have picked up huge bags just when I'm doing plovers yeah. after July 4th. It was incredible. Yeah, the, the main thing is that during the summer holiday, State Parks does stops all beach cleanups um, because of plover season. So um, whenever somebody does a beach cleanup, a lot of people just start entering our fenced areas and so we we try to avoid that um as well as just uh we have a lot of plovers who don't know what fences are and so they nest outside the fence um and so it's just our way of giving them the extra space and not having to deal with people but i do like the idea maybe around um sometime after the new year we'll probably plan a beach cleanup for our plover guardians to do kind of a post holiday pre-plover season <laughs> beach cleanup I think that would be wonderful and then we'll just maybe encourage all of us individually you know after yeah. holidays to, to do it while we're there yeah it, you're it really makes yeah huge definitely sense. I think it's um it will be huge yeah and it's like it's one of those things where it's like we can't have like a group of 20 people go out and do a beach cleanup during the plover season but if you're on your own and you're already out on the beach and you're just picking up trash as you come across it that's fine um so you sh should still feel empowered to pick up trash when you're when you're just doing your roaming activities well, thanks so much, everyone, for that good discussion. It's about 7.07, .07, so I'm going to do, like, last call, last <laughs> call for questions and comments. Um, so, yeah, anything else? Any lingering questions? Um, uh, yeah, in the chat, if you hadn't opened the chat yet, I put in the link to the Snowy Plover Guardian website in there. So um, hopefully you've all got that bookmarked, because that is a super good resource. And, um, yeah, so make sure you click on that one link in the chat before we all wrap up here. But um, but yeah, thanks again. And I do hope, yeah, you get some time out at Carmel River State Beach in Monterey and um and yeah, hopefully more tabling. <laughs> and more tabling events. Yeah. If there's actually that's if there's any, you know, community opportunity that's uh vaguely nature related, yes. uh you can certainly send um ideas our way if you're like, hey, why don't you guys come mm -hmm. table at this this event? Yeah. We or might, if you just want to set yes. up, yeah. Or if you just want to set up a table at an access point at Carmel, you're welcome to do that any day of the week. Um, you'll just have to email me to coordinate the tabling kit pickup. Yep. So awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much, everybody. And I hope you have a nice rest of your evening. We'll get this uploaded to YouTube pretty soon. And um, we'll have a link to it probably in the next, uh, the next Plover Guardian newsletter. Yep. Um, for sure. So Thanks all. We'll go ahead and stop.